Yeah, hi. I'm Dr. Nitin Sauber and I'm going to talk on upper limb arterial Doppler. So what is very unusual about upper limb uh, arterial Doppler is that first of all, symptomatic arterial disease is less common in the upper limb as compared to lower limb. One of the most common presenting feature of upper limb ischemia is Reynolds phenomena. That means the patient gets episodes of uh, uh, discoloration in the fingertips, typically during cold season or sometimes even with an emotional trauma. In the upper limb, we need to think of uh, systemic disorders, collagen disorders. We need to think of arthritis, thoracic outlet syndrome, supplement steel embolisms, which are more common in the upper limb as compared to lower limb. And then, of course, in the upper limb, very often patients has, have very good collaterals and therefore symptoms are very often less. Here, for example, we have a patient who has got a complete occlusion of the supplement artery, but there is an excellent collateral coming from the internal mammary artery and ultimately the symptoms were not too bad. Trauma is very common in the upper limb, vascular trauma, typically uh, either industrial accidents or uh, agricultural accidents. Uh, very often, one of the most common indications for looking at upper limb arteries is of course evaluating arteries uh, prior to an AV fistula or a graft for dialysis. And then of course, uh, we look at the palmar arch patency for taking up the retinal artery for CABG surgery. Uh, you have to be very familiar with the anatomy just like any other examination. We always begin with the vertebral artery. That means we ask the patient to uh, lie supine, extend the neck on a pillow and then evaluate the vertebral artery along its entire extent in grayscale, on color and in pulse Doppler. On color, make sure that the direction of flow in the carotid artery and the direction of flow in the vertebral artery are the same. And this is very important to pick up uh, subclinical steel. Uh, then keeping the position same, we look at the subclavian artery. Typically, we try and go as close to the origin as possible and we tilt the beam towards the malibrim sternum in the proximal portion of the subclavian artery. And of course, as we go distally uh, towards the axilla, then we like to tilt the probe on the opposite side. The subclavian artery typically is a very high resistance sort of uh, artery with a very uh, with a reversal of diastolic flow. And you might get a little forward flow uh, a little later, but it's a very high resistance sort of a waveform. Now, one of the most important problems in subclavian artery is looking at origins of the subclavian artery, the origin of left subclavian artery and the origin of the brachiocephalic trunk. And this is because uh, they are hidden by the bones. So, what we do typically is either you use a cardiac probe, which has got a very small foot head. Or we use a trans vaginal probe and try and look at origin. But this is important because very often a stenosis is at the origin. The axillary artery, of course, we evaluate by hyperextending uh, the arm, and then it is easy to evaluate, but we should not give too much of pressure. Otherwise, very often, the, uh, if you are also looking at a vein, the vein can get uh, compressed. Uh, the brachial artery, typically, we go medially and trace it all along its extent, right from the axilla uh, to its bifurcation. Now it's very important to evaluate the brachial artery in a transverse plane also. Uh, this is because uh, not only can we see the lumen well, but when you evaluate the brachial artery in a transverse plane, we can pick up any anomalies of the brachial artery. For example, very often we see a high bifurcation of the brachial artery coming up the upper arm and this is a very important information which we need to give to surgeons uh, before doing a fistula surgery. It is very important to look at the brachial artery bifurcation. So that's a, a brachial artery bifurcation with the radial artery, of course, going superficially and the other artery going down. So uh, then we trace the entire radial artery right from its origin. It is easy to evaluate because it is superficial. And as you go distally again, we see a sort of a high resistance waveform. This patient is elderly and usually in elderly, we get a very high resistance waveform in the radial artery. Then we look at the ulnar artery, as we know that the ulnar artery dips down at its origin. And the mid portion of ulnar artery is very often difficult to see, but uh, once you come closer to the wrist, then the ulnar artery becomes superficial and again it becomes uh, easy to evaluate. There are some tests which we need to do in the upper limb. Uh, one test is known as Allen's test. This is done to look at a uh, palmar arch patency to find out if the palmar arch is patent before we take the radial artery for bypass surgery. So what we do is look at the radial artery, compress the ulnar and look out for this increase in velocity. 
Then we look at the unlaid compressed radial and again look out for increase in velocity. This increase in velocity typically should be at least 30 to 40 centimeters per second. So here we are doing the Allen's test. We are looking at the radial artery, compressing the unlaid artery and then we look out for this increase in velocity. Here we are looking at the unlaid artery, compressing the radial artery and then again looking out for this increase in velocity. Uh, there is something known as a modified duplex silence test where we uh, typically uh, keep the probe, a uh, small footed probe in the snuff box, uh, look at the radial artery here and then compress the proximal radial artery. So if the uh, powder hatch is patent then again we get reversal of flow coming from the alar artery and once you see a reversal like this that means again that the palmer hatch is patent. Then there is a test known as uh, reactive hyperemia. Uh, this is done typically again uh, before uh, fistula. Uh, typically what we are looking out for is an increment in the blood flow after a pinda fistula. Now this test tells us whether the artery is able to dilate uh, adequately after ischemia, not only after ischemia but once there is a fistula done as we know that there is an increased demand in the blood and able, the artery should be able to cop up uh, this increased demands and this test is good for that. So typically what we do is ask the patient to hold the fist tight and then evaluate the radial artery. Typically what we see is a very high resistance sort of a waveform. Then we ask the patient to release the fist and after releasing fist typically what we see is an increase in the diastolic flow. That tells us that the artery is good for dialysis. Whereas this is what we are doing here, patient we are looking at the radial artery the fist is very tight and we can see there is a high resistance, in fact there is a reversal of flow and after releasing the fist there is a reactive hyperemia and we can see that there is increase in the diastolic flow. This is, uh, this is a normal sort of a response. We can also look at the palmar arch uh, that, uh, and we can also look at the uh, flow in the digital arteries. Now this typically uh, we do uh, when the patient is suspected to have a small arterial disease. That means, for example, uh, if everything is fine up to the radial and alveolar artery but the patient still has Renaud's, that is the time you will start looking at small arteries in the palm or in the fingers. Uh, there are some other tests uh, like, uh, for example, uh, we look out for thoracic outlet compression. Uh, there are three or four tests which you can do. One is Axon's test. In this, what we do is ask the patient to stand uh, group down the ipsilateral uh, hand which you are evaluating and ask the patient to tilt on the same side of uh, where you are evaluating and take a deep breath in. So typically if the patient has a thoracic outlet problem then we can see that the radial artery becomes weak uh, the clinically. Uh, what we can also do is keep our ultrasound pro and look out for alteration in the waveform. Uh, there is a test known as neck tilting test or a reverse axon. Uh, typically what we do here is ask the patient to look on the opposite side of the examination and again if the patient uh, does not have a thoracic outlet then there is no significant alteration in the waveform. Uh, there are other tests for example there is something known as a costoclavicular compression test, uh, there is Wright's uh, test which is an hyperabduction test, there is a Roos test. Uh, this is what we commonly do in our practice. So what we do is ask the patient to raise the hands, hyperextend, hyperabduct and then move the fingers. Uh, you can look at a radial artery but this becomes very cumbersome so commonly what we do is look at the subclavian artery or the axillary artery and we will see a case uh, a little uh, uh, subsequently. Uh, then there is a test uh, which is known as cold stimulation test for Raynaud's syndrome. So again when you are suspecting a systemic disorder like an SLE, a patient is symptomatic as a clinically a Raynaud's syndrome then what we do is a, a cold stimulation test. So here what we do is ask the patient to hold some ice in the hand uh, till the patient is able to hold it, maybe typically 15 seconds or so. Uh, look at the waveform, typically after holding the ice, it's a very high resistance waveform and you can see a reversal of flow in the diastole. Then we ask the patient to release the ice and typically in a normal patient after 1 minute, 2 minutes or at the most 3 minutes, you can see that the waveforms can come back to normal. Very often you might get a higher diastolic flow. This is a normal response to a cold stimulation test. So why do we look at the vertebral first is uh, to pick up subclavian steel because once you have a subclavian steel your diagnosis is simple and the examination is over in a matter of 2 minutes. 
So here, for example, we have a patient who has got a complete steel on the left side, the, the vertebral artery is blue, and there is an occlusion of the subclavian artery. And on the right side, there is a partial steel that's a typical funny bunny side, and the patient has a stenosis at the origin of the brachiocephalic trunk. Uh, this, we can have subclavian artery occlusion. So typically, when you have a, you have a thrombus, uh, prior to the occlusion, you get this high resistance wave forming. There is multiple wave uh, typically happening in the diastole because the blood goes and hits against a dead wall. And distally, of course, you get a dampened flow. Uh, that's a patient who had a thoracic outlet symptoms. So we can see that the subclavian artery at rest has a velocity of about 80. After the ROOS test, we can see that the velocity is increasing to about 300 or 400 centimeters per second, telling us that the artery is sort of narrowed down. If you look at a vein, that's a normal subclavian vein at rest, and after the hyperabduction, hyperextension maneuver, there is narrowing of the subclavian vein with an increase in the velocity of the subclavian vein. So that is typical of the thoracic outlet. In fact, uh, me and Dr. Raju Adva from Hinduja were the first to describe uh, venous changes in the thoracic outlet syndrome many years back. Autoarthritis is very common in the upper limb. Uh, typically, subclavian artery is very often affected. And what you typically get is a long segment of uh, narrowing of wall thickening in the subclavian artery or the carotid artery. That's very classical of autoarthritis, very common in the upper limb. We can have axillary artery stenosis uh, with aliasing and narrowing of flow channels and very high velocities. Uh, we can have brachial artery occlusion. Now look at this a number of collaterals. Very often there are a lot of collaterals which come up in the upper limb, but this patient of course has a dampened flow uh, as, as we went this way. This lady had severe discoloration of the hand. You could look at the fingers, and of course the cause was uh, uh, occlusion of the brachial artery. Both the ulnar and radial arteries were also occluded. This is a very bad case. In this era of COVID, uh, we are seeing upper limb arterial occlusion because of the disease. Uh, we know that whenever there is a, a, a hypercoagulable state, there can of course be thrombosis. And the virtual triad consists of abnormal vessel wall, abnormal flow, and a hypercoagulable state. And typically in COVID, there are a lot of factors which contribute to these factors and ultimately can give rise to a hypercoagulable state and a thrombosis. So we have seen patients presenting with upper limb ischemia who have who are, uh, subsequently turned out to be COVID positive. Here's a patient, young patient who came and did not have fever, had only upper limb pain and there is an occlusion of the subclavian artery, the axillary, radial and the ulnar arteries with severely dampened flow. Another patient, uh, 45 years old, uh, who had pain in uh, both the forearms, uh, again not very symptomatic, had fever for one or two days and both the radial artery and the ulnar artery in both the forearms were occluded. And uh, this is a patient again who had uh, ischemic changes in the hand. And there was thrombosis of the right superficial power arch in the distal ulnar artery, and subsequently he had to be operated. Uh, we can have uh, uh, changes in the fingers, uh, typically in this can be because of atherosclerosis, but typically when we think of small arterial disease, we need to think of collagen disorders uh, or systemic disorders, like for example, SLE. So, what we need to differentiate in upper limb is an obstructive disease. A form of visospastic disease and we need to uh, separate out a small arterial disease from major arterial disease. So typically major arterial diseases are up to the distal radial and ulnar and uh, they present more commonly with either obstruction or stenosis. Whereas uh, typically a small arterial disease uh, of the palm, typically for example collagen disorders, they uh, they present with uh, typically uh, a vasos, uh, as a vasospasm or a vasospastic disorder. And a good test to look out for vasospasm, as we said, is the cold stimulation test. So what happens here is that after the patient, uh, we ask the patient to hold the eyes and release the eyes, the waveforms do not come back to normal. We persistently see a high resistance waveform and the patient typically complain of a lot of pain. So here's a young lady uh, we did in chest slope. She had SLE and there's a persistent high resistance waveform and this lasted for almost 20-25 minutes. And the patient had severe pain in the hand and almost repented having done this test because of the pain which she had. Uh, embolism is very common in the upper limb as compared to lower limb. Here is a, a person who came with upper limb pain early in the morning in fact. And uh, the, what we saw was a complete occlusion uh, of the axillary artery. So we just put a probe on the heart 
and saw a source of embolism on the mitral valve. He has a known case of mitral valve disease. This is a person who had an accident in the industry. He was working on some machine and his hand sort of went partly in one of the part of the machine and he developed a complete tear of the biceps muscle with the brachialatory occlusion. Uh, this is a gentleman who was traveling in the train, local train of Mumbai and then someone hit a stone from outside and he injured his brachial artery and a, and a, a traumatic aneurysm of the radial artery. Uh, this is a gentleman working with uh, the MSCB, accidentally touched a, a live wire and then had an electric injury of the left hand and when he came to us, the entire hand was discolored and uh, there was occlusion of the radial and the other artery. So thank you so much uh, for your attention. Local limb evaluation is quite different from lower limb evaluation. Uh, the diseases are again quite different. And most important, remember that there are some, some special tests you need to do in the upper limb as compared to lower limb. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.